just a 2020s girl. And things are different, but things are still, there's, things are still complicated. Hi, my name is Peter Knett, and I'm here with M.H. Murray and Mark Clennon, the filmmakers behind the new film, I Don't Know Who You Are. So let's talk about your film, which I have not fully recovered from yet. It's so harrowing and also so excellent, and it's your first feature films, both of you, right? Yes. <laughs> so maybe for anyone who's not aware, could either of you or both of you maybe offer the anxiety-inducing premise of this film? So I Don't Know Who You Are is the story about a young man living in Toronto who's a musician, he's an artist, and he is, you know, man of the people. <laughs> and he is unfortunately um, the victim of a violent sexual assault. And the film talks about his journey to recover and to find himself. But it also is an expose on sort of the underbelly of Toronto and the inequities within our healthcare system and just the inequities period. So it's a few different stories all at once. It's a love story. It's an, a story about surviving a tragic event, but it's also a story about the social construct of our city. Okay. I might throw some extra things in there. I had a description for And MH, this story is somewhat loosely based on an experience you had. Um, yeah. As much as you want to get into it, why did you want to share this story? Why was it important for you to get it out there in the world? I guess it was like a mixture of lo logistics and then also like a desire to, I guess, achieve some sort of like creative or personal catharsis maybe. I initially had a different movie that I was going to shoot back in uh, 2020 and then the pandemic happened. It was going to be like a gay horror body creature movie. Um, and then when the pandemic happened and it got all shut down, uh, I had a lot of time to ruminate and ponder and think about my experiences. And during that time, our short film Ghosts came out. It was screening at like uh, Inside Out, SIF, and a few other festivals. And it had a really positive reception. And so we kind of thought maybe we can collaborate and create something. And I spoke to Mark about the story that I wanted to tell. And we talked about how he could bring some of his own experiences into it. And, we could create like a little cinematic salad of <laughs> our experiences and um, this character of Benjamin that we created in Ghost functioned as like a sort of something that I could filter my own experience through and so sort of by chance this ended up being my first feature and I think it all worked out for the best because it's a very personal story and now that I got out of my system I can make like spooky movies now. <laughs> And it's a collaboration in many ways between the two of you in this film because you both wore so many hats on this film. You did the music, you starred in it, story editor produced it, correct? And you, let's see if I can remember, produced it, directed it, uh, wrote the screenplay. Uh, that's a lot. And also you shot this film in 13 days, which yeah. to me, when I saw that, it just seemed so wild. Like, how did you do that? Like, if it's intense to watch, it must have been very intense to make. It was pretty intense. And we didn't have permission to shoot in a lot of the places that we shot. So that added another little layer of intensity. But it was pretty intimate and low budget. And I think that allowed us to be pretty free with the collaboration and we shot a lot of it in Mark's apartment actually which was didn't have permission <laughs> <to that either. laughs> it was very invasive but I mean you can speak to it but I think for all of us being in a comfortable space uh, allowed everybody to feel like it was kind of it was like fun a lot of the time it didn't feel too stressful like overall this is my first film so I think I didn't really know what to compare it to and it's one of those things where looking back when you talk about some of the things about like the budget constraints or whatever it's only in hindsight that I was like oh yeah I guess that was hard but in the moment because that's mm -hmm. what we did and what we had it didn't feel crazy and I you know being so intimately connected to the story and knowing what we were going into the story with all of the things that may have been a little uncomfortable, whether it's, you know, gear in my apartment or whatever, just made sense because I was like, this is what we need to do to get this story, this important story told. But I'm so proud of this film and I'm so proud of what we're able to do with what we had. And to think that what we had has brought us here to TIFF and has brought so many great opportunities and so many great moments of people saying they've loved the film makes us so proud because if only they knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The struggle, yeah. Well, it must take a lot of trust between the two of you. I'm also curious just how you met and how it sort of evolved to the point where you're like, let's do this together. We just kind of met like through the gay scene in the city. Like we would just kind of cross paths and see each other. I guess I started watching his music videos. He has like this really interest. He does like interpretive dancing. Um, and I was really drawn <laughs> to the way that he was dancing. And in Ghosts, the final scene is like a dance scene, so. I'm not I 
find someone that I felt could be like really natural. And when I pitched it to him, he was like, mm, I'm not really an actor anymore. You know, he's retired from his acting days, but he took a leap of faith, I think, doing that short film with me. And it was only one day that we shot, but we did it in his apartment. It was very intimate. And then the film ended up having a very warm reception. I think that we kept, you know, just kikiing and keeping in touch, and we do a lot of plotting, a lot of masterminding, just thinking about different projects we can do. And I think it just evolved kind of very organically. And then over the pandemic, we continued working together and started developing I Don't Know Who You Are. And now, here we are. Are you permanently out of retirement now, or is this a one-time <laughs> thing? Definitely permanently out of retirement. This has awakened a new career and a new path for me. Definitely still moving forward with music, but lots of acting on the horizon as well. That's great. I mean, this, you're incredible in this film, so you should definitely oh, go you. for it. I feel like this film has so much to say about a lot of things, but one thing that really stood out to, stood out to me was um, the socioeconomics of HIV. Uh, despite what some people think, HIV is not eradicated, but it has now become sort of an issue of, of privilege and money and access to medications that this film sort of definitely delves mm -hmm. into. What did either of you sort of want to say with this film in terms of like the state of HIV in 2023? Oh, I think it's really complex because I do think, yeah, there's a lot of mixed messaging, a lot of miscommunications. I think some people think that it's over and then other people are more informed, I guess. Yeah. It's definitely, we're at a different place than we were, obviously, in the 80s. But I think it was such a thin line between being too like on the nose with explaining the, all the elements of it. But I think we just wanted to show like a, a human kind of struggling against bureaucracy and just that stressful feeling of being, you know, fearing for your health not really knowing what could happen if you do get this diagnosis. And it was important for us to show someone in the film who does live with HIV, who has, is healthy, is living a positive life, is sexually desired, is you know able to love and things of that nature. So I think, yeah, it's very complicated. We didn't set out with like a specific one mission. I think we just wanted to try to tell something that felt honest yeah. and something that does feel like, yeah, it's, it's the year, it's the 2020s girl. And things are different, but things are still, there's things are still complicated. Yeah, I mean, and it also, I feel like just says a lot about how hard it is to live in a city in 2023 um, when you don't have a lot of money. I'm curious because you're both artists. There's a lot of talk about sort of the future of being artists in cities with skyrocketing rents. <laughs> do you think there is a future for artists in cities? Like, what do you think we do now going forward as creative communities yeah. trying to live in, in the cities that, you know, offer a lot in many ways, but also are increasingly impossible in terms of money. It's complicated because cities like Toronto are places that artists like us gravitate towards because there's so many opportunities here and there's so many outlets for us to be ourselves and express ourselves and network and meet people. And, you know, it'd be very hard for us to do this film in, I'm not going to say anywhere, so I don't offend anyone, but in, you know, like a, a small town somewhere, it would be very hard to pull off some of these things. But at the same time, because of the demand and because it's such a big city, it's, it's incredibly expensive. But I think that the film really highlights that, and it's highlighted the fact that Benjamin has multiple jobs and he's really hustling. And I think that it's unfortunate that people have to go above and beyond just to survive. But I think that is the type of tenacity and the type of grit that artists in 2023 have because they're faced with so many challenges and they're an artist like myself. I'm an actor, but I also have other streams of income, you know, and I think you just kind of have to rise to the occasion just to exist in the city. I don't know what the future is for us as artists, but I think that as long as we're able to to fight for our art and to work hard, I think there's still, you know, Toronto will never not be a good place for yeah. for artists, you know? Yeah, I'm hopeful, honestly. I, I don't know if it's like a modern phenomenon or if artists have always been this way where it's sort of like you have to do, hustle and, you know, definitely in a modern sense, it's like, okay, you're waiting for invoices. There might be a bunch of gigs that you did, but you haven't been paid yet. So then you're in this precarious place where like one mistake or one incident can, you know, throw your life into a whirlwind. But I think that's that's not just artists. I think everybody experiences that to some extent. I think for artists, it's just the difficult thing is when you're constantly trying to survive. The sad reality of being an artist is that you do need to have time to just not think yeah. about that. Because if you don't have time to do that, you can't create anything. So I think the key that I've found and that the people I see succeeding, it's like you have to somehow find a way to hustle, but also carve out space to just like chill out, 
and like think yeah. and ponder about what you want to say and what kind of stories you want to tell. Because if you're constantly rushing and constantly, that's why in the film we show Benjamin kind of like, you know, writing, like practicing, just lollygagging and dilly-dallying. Like that's so important, I think, yeah. for an artist. Um, for so, anyone even. Yeah. yeah, and I think in the city, there's so many distractions and it's so loud and there's so much going on. But I think as artists, the most important thing is to try to find that space to just really think and create. Yeah, absolutely. So this film in the TIFF program guide, I believe, is described as a, a micro-budget uncut gems, mm -hmm. um, I guess in part because of how it makes you feel. Um, how do you feel about that comparison? I feel great about it, honestly. I'm like, honestly, it wasn't my intention, like making the film. That wasn't one of my influences, but obviously that's a great film. And it's a film that is very sure of itself. And it's a film that has a very specific feeling. And so I think the comparison makes sense in terms of following a character on a, you know, prolonged anxiety attack, just like, you know, your t-shirt. <laughs> sure. um, yeah, I would, I, I had a lot of different influences for the film. One of the main ones was like uh, the Dardenne Brothers movie with uh, Marion Cotillard called Two Days, One Night, yeah. where she like has a weekend to basically get her life together. That was, it's more of a quiet film, but that film and then the Three Colors trilogy, yeah. especially Blue. There's like a few little nods to it in this film, but that feeling of someone going through a traumatic event and then sort of trying to escape from the world, but being forced to connect with people around them and kind of overcoming that feeling of grief was really inspirational for me. And obviously, Juliette Binoche is incredible. Yeah. Mark had some big shoes to fill, <laughs> yeah, but I think he succeeded. <laughs> I, I agree, and they are big shoes to fill, but you succeeded, and I also feel like as anxiety-inducing as the film is, there's a lot of hope in this film. Mm -hmm. um, people shouldn't think they're just gonna go and be stressed out for the entire thing. There's a, this film offers a lot uh, beyond mm -hmm. the stress. Yeah, I really wanted it to end on a hopeful note. Like, I think it's okay to write queer characters however you want, whether they're good or bad, sad endings, trauma, but for me with this project, and for us, it was important for Benjamin's journey to end on a little bit bittersweet, but you know, there's hope and there's a future, and I think that's what we're all just thinking about and dreaming of, right? Yeah. A happy ending, like a princess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you both so much for, for being here today, and good luck with this film as it gets further and further out into the world. I'm so excited for people to experience it and share it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, and thanks for watching it. Yeah, my pleasure.